The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 13681 in the name of Angela Constance on support for families of loved ones killed abroad. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Angela Constance to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Presiding officer, Kirsty Maxwell is described by her mother as a, a beautiful girl who touched the hearts of many. A popular young woman whose friends and families would always choose to confide in. 18 months ago, whilst in Benidorm with her friends, Kirsty's life was taken, as her mother says, in incredibly brutal, cruel ways and in unexplained circumstances. And ever since then, Kirsty's husband, Adam Maxwell, and her parents, Brian and Denise Curry, have been on an arduous and anguished quest for justice, justice for Kirsty. And Kirsty's mum and her aunt Angela are here tonight uh, in the public gallery with their local MP, Hannah Burdell, uh, and others, uh, Deborah Pearson, Harry and Anthony Lindsay, uh, Kirsty McNichol, and Julie Love, all whose loved ones were killed abroad due to murder, manslaughter or suspicious circumstances. And I have no doubts that I speak on behalf of this entire chamber when I express our heartfelt condolences uh, to all of these families. But I can't help thinking that these same families must get weary of our words of sympathy when they're crying out for action and they're crying out for answers. And as MSPs, our, our words are important, but so our, our deeds particularly to those constituents who reach out to us in their darkest hour. And I thank members who have supported the motion in my name and have helped to secure this debate tonight. And I'm grateful uh, to members who will also uh, make a contribution. And I want to pass on the apologies uh, of Neil Finlay, MSP, who is at a public meeting uh, that we should both be at in Stonyburn. And I hope that that shows the importance of this issue when old foes and ad adversaries like Neil and I can also uh, cooperate on matters of such great importance. The BBC documentary Killed Abroad highlighted the unanswered questions around the death of Kirsty Maxwell and Craig Mallon, and crucially, the plight of their families. And it is difficult to adjust to the death of a loved one. It is more difficult if the death is a result of a crime or suspicious circumstances. And it's harder still uh, if that death occurred abroad. And the news that a loved one has died can be delivered in a variety of ways and can add to the shock and trauma experienced by families. Adam Maxwell was informed of his wife's death by a brief and unclear phone call from the Spanish police. Other challenges and complexities are dealing with unfamiliar jurisdictions and justice systems. The cost of repatriation is on average £4,000, but can be as much as £8,000. Finding and funding suitable overseas legal representation, the cost of travel and translation services, insurance issues, and post-mortem and autopsy difficulties. All of this and more whilst grieving and dealing with the demands of daily life. Families informed that the service provided by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and Consular Services is patchy, inconsistent, and support is, is far from proactive. Consequently, the Westminster All-Party Parliamentary Group on Deaths Abroad are pursuing matters rigorously, given that 80 to 90 UK citizens are murdered abroad every year. The APPG has taken evidence from 50 families from across the UK, 10 families from Scotland, and organisations such as Murdered uh, Abroad and Deaths Abroad, You Are Not Alone, which was established by Julie Love after the death of her son in Venezuela in 2009. And the group chaired by Hannah Burdell MP will soon report its findings and make recommendations to mainly, but not exclusively, to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Clearly, the FCO have a leading role, but there is also a role for devolved services, justice, health, how we support the third sector, and of course, in our external relations with other jurisdictions. So there is room for improvement at both a UK and a Scottish level. I know that the Scottish Government has raised its concerns of Kirsty's family with both the UK and Spanish governments, 
and Police Scotland stand ready to assist the ongoing investigation into Kirsty's death if invited to do so by the Spanish authorities. The Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service does not have the jurisdiction to investigate deaths that occur outside Scotland, except in a, a very few limited circumstances, one of which is when the death occurred by murder or culpable homicide by another British citizen. It may also be worth considering a review of the implementation of recent FEI legislation. The Scottish Government has an overarching commitment to support victims with access to information and a wide range of services. And yes, this is harder to achieve when overseas justice agencies are involved and we're relying on them to, to investigate. But nonetheless, these important principles should apply in our endeavours for all victims here in Scotland. Therefore, will the Cabinet Secretary ensure that full consideration of the needs of those who have had a loved one killed abroad due to a crime or suspicious circumstances is undertaken by the Victims and Witness Team headed by Anna Donald and also the Victims Task Force uh, that Humza Yusuf will chair himself. It's important to note that the, the new homicide service uh, to be welcomed and it will be established uh, next April. But currently that excludes victims affected by death abroad by suspected crime or suspicious circumstances. So I hope that this is something that the Cabinet Se Secretary can also rectify. The needs and rights of families affected by deaths abroad is also missing from the Victims Code in Scotland and the revised We Are Working Together for Victims and Witnesses interagency guidance. And although considered, Police Scotland will not deploy family liaison officers in all cases where a British national has been murdered abroad, as this is dependent on what, if any, investigative role they have. But would the Cabinet Secretary consider guidelines or regulations whereby the host police force of the family have a duty to provide a service, perhaps in partnership with other organisations. And I actually think this would be welcomed by Police Scotland. Victims Support Scotland inform that despite having a protocol with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office since 2012, have only received seven notifications of Scots murdered abroad. Police Scotland are not officially notified by FCO if a Scot is murdered abroad, so the process could be improved and should also include deaths by serious crime or suspicious circumstances. Trauma-aware notifications should kick-start trauma-informed support. So I wonder, will the Cabinet Sec Secretary do his best to help families like Kirsty's to have the right service at the right time and give full consideration to how access to emotional, practical, financial and legal support can be improved. Presiding officer, I want to end my remarks today by quoting Kirsty's dad, Brian, uh, who in correspondence said to me, I feel we have a chance here in Scotland to make a change and do something that actually supports victims and their families, legally, emotionally, and financially, a protocol or vehicle that guides and supports victims' families through the myriad of hoops and hurdles that ultimately forces victims' families to give up hope, to give up on the system, and to give up on life. Presiding officer, I hope that together that we can take the chance for change and give hope to the family of Kirsty Maxwell and others in their hour of greatest need. I know it may sound unreasonable, but may I ask those in the public gallery to refrain from showing appreciation? <laughs> Thank you very much. And we now move on to the open debate and its speeches of up to four minutes, please. And I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to take part and congratulate and thank Angela Constance for bringing this uh, motion to the Chamber this afternoon. As Ms Constance's motion acknowledges, the recent BBC documentary, Killed Abroad, did highlight the apparent obstacles and difficulties that some families have faced in seeking information and support in such an awful and tragic circumstance. Indeed, I, for one, recognise the profound impact that this must have on someone who has lost a loved one abroad. I also recognise that their experiences have seemingly exposed gaps in support and procedures provided by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, 
to families of those affected and, of course, to those who need to be addressed. And these deputy presiding officers have been acknowledged and need to be addressed. Therefore, it is right and proper that we have the opportunity to debate and discuss this this evening in the Scottish Parliament. And, Deputy Presiding Officer, I would also like to thank the all-party group, the parliamentary group on deaths abroad and consul services, uh, because they have made a real contribution to this process. And as we already know, it is often the work of all-party groups or cross-party groups that do have an enormous insight and they take the time to look at uh, studying hearing evidence and analysing how many organisations participate and their bid is to improve uh, the experiences of individuals and I think that is uh, being achieved as we go forward. I believe that they have seen an excess of 50 families and so far they have taken evidence uh, at the all party group uh, and the group is currently taking evidence from a number of families whose individuals affected by death abroad and I think that's also very important. Once it has gathered the evidence, uh, the responses will be, uh, the group will utilise the facts and the information that they have taken, and it will go to both the United Kingdom government and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in a bid to improve the methods by which valuable support may be granted and may be gained. I'm also aware that the, it's very sad that the tragedies that do take place for individuals who are currently lost or who have been reported missing abroad uh, that, that gives the anxiety to families who find themselves in that situation where they do not know what has happened to their loved one. To this end, uh, it is, there is excellent charities that are working in this sector, uh, and I'd like to pay some tribute to them as we progress through this debate. The enormous lengths to providing advice uh, for uh, individuals who find themselves in that worrying and that anxiety and that incomprehensible situation where they've lost a loved one. Uh, try, Charities like the Lucy Backman Trust, this trust has been providing outstanding level of care to families of, mem of British mem murdered uh, or manslaughtered victims since 2008. They are also able to offer advice, repatriation assistance, problem solving, fundraising support and many other facets of assistance to victims overseas. They provide families with information, liaison, advice and support throughout a missing person's case overseas, and this remains core part of their operation. The skills, the knowledge, the contacts they have gained in years in providing this type of level of support, along with mutually respective responsibilities for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, have enabled them to expand their remit. Uh, and I, I think that uh, is very important with anyone who's dealing with a situation or a victim of a serious crime. So it is vital that we sit up and listen to families and loved ones, note their concerns raised, address the failings and improve the service that we should be providing. Deputy Presiding Officer, I must indicate that this awful situation to deal with uh, and we should ensure that the, the situation that they have to deal with should not and must not be exacerbated by any of the failings by officials and obstacles that are put in their way. The goal must be support, advice, and compassion to all involved. We must ensure that, that we are getting it right for every family and the services that are fit for purpose. And it would appear that that is not always the case. And that has to be managed and that has to be acknowledged by the UK government and by the Scottish government, because what we want to do is learn lessons for the future. Thank you. I call Bob Doris to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I want to start by paying tribute to Angela Constance for securing this vitally important members' debate, as well as to the family of Kirsty Maxwell for their determination to get answers for them and justice for Kirsty. Uh, I also wish to pay tribute to my constituent, Julie Love, MBE, a remarkable woman from Mary Hill who, following the tragic drowning of her son, Colin, in Venezuela, has campaigned tirelessly to improve advice, help and support for families in such circumstances. The charity she founded, Death Abroad You're Not Alone, has directly offered support both emotionally and practically eh, on a volunteer basis, and Julie sits at the heart of that advice giving and support. Let me therefore pick up on a number of areas where I feel Julie would wish me to raise a number of concerns. In a briefing for this debate, Victim Support Scotland notes the support they seek to offer for those who are murdered or involved in suspicious deaths or or victimised overseas. That support is most welcome, of course. Uh, however, that does, does exclude victims of tragedies such as road traffic accidents and in Colin Love's case, drownings. 
let me stress that the families of those loved ones strongly feel a sense of loss, a sense of anger, and a sense of victimization. I believe that we must broaden the range of families that are offered support by Victim Support Scotland and others. I know families can struggle to get authorities overseas or indeed here at home to consider certain deaths as suspicious. Furthermore, what evidence is used to determine whether a death is suspicious and who decides that? Broadening the range of families supported mitigates some of those concerns. So would the right to a post-mortem back here in Scotland, which is something I would like to call for today. But it's also simply the right thing to do. Getting clear, reliable, consistent, or indeed any information at times from the FCO can be a challenge irrespective of how your loved one passes away or dies overseas. As can navigating your way around various overseas legal systems and processes, it's certainly not easy and it's certainly not inexpensive either. Bring your loved one back home from abroad and that's something we'll touch upon later. So let's get that definition widened and let's start to get meaningful support in place. Uh, Victim Support Scotland states that it has, it has a protocol in place with the former Commonwealth Office since 2012 and has only received seven notifications of Scots murdered and the number of actual referrals is much smaller. I find that deeply worrying. I'm unclear if that protocol has ever been published, let, let alone promoted to ensure families are aware of their rights and support available. A number of years ago, myself and Julia Love sought to get a relevant stakeholder meeting together across police, across justice, across external affairs, across health, of course, Victim Support Scotland. But it felt very fragmented in nature and government responsibilities threw up challenges in that respect. We did a cross-cutting work at a Scottish level, across ministerial briefs, of course, but also we need one individual Scottish government minister taking full responsibility for the overall approach to deaths abroad, irrespective of what, what a subtopic area it may fall within. I'm aware that the new Victim Support Task Force has been established by the Justice Secretary, and I'm sure my constituent, Julie Love, would welcome a dialogue with that forum also. And I also note Victim Support Scotland is leading on the development of a new homicide service for Scotland that will see families getting support via a dedicated caseworker. Murders abroad are excluded, but Victim Support Scotland have suggested the willingness to extend that scope. And of course, it should be extended, not just for murders abroad, but widened out far broader. There's so much more I would like to say. I'm not going to presenting officer because I know time is short, but Julia Love, my constituent, I've mentioned several times, has already changed the law once in this parliament to extend on a discretionary basis fatal accident inquiries into the deaths of those who die overseas. I am worried and alarmed that discretion has never been used. There's no point in having laws on the statute books if there's not exercise in positive ways to get justice and answers for families. Uh, I actually think we'll finish off by paying tribute to Angela Constance and say I think this area deserves a full plenary session debate in the normal time of this parliament, not just a member's debate. And this is a really important, crucial first step. Daniel Johnson, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I begin by starting off where Bob Doris just finished there? And I think he is absolutely right. This is a very serious topic, and I think one that does worth, uh, is worth further consideration in full plenary time in this place, and I certainly lend my support to that. But I can I also thank Angela Constance for bringing this debate to this chamber, but more importantly, associate myself with the, the comments and sentiments she made at the beginning of the speech, because it is wonderful that we have families here. It is absolutely right that our thoughts and our uh, sentiments are with them, but what they need to hear is about how we're going to make a change and make a difference rather than just simply warm words. And I think that is absolutely crucial for this debate and future ones that we have on this topic. Because an unexpected death is always traumatic for family members. There's an obvious and immediate questions that will occur. What happened? Why did it happen? Did something go wrong? Was the help that was supposed to be there, was it there? And if there was a question of fault, who is responsible? And what will happen to them? Now, those are the questions that will happen in any unexplained death. 
But when those circumstances happen abroad, then the complexity is simply compounded. Because you're not just dealing with those questions that you need to have settled in order to move on and have closure for whatever that means. But you're dealing with a, a foreign system that potentially looks complicated. It's expensive to deal with because it's in another country. There's confusion about how that system works, how it will make decisions, and indeed there's different languages to contend with. And I think those are the issues that the documentary Killed Abroad brought to life so well. It is a terrible fate and one that we need to do better in terms of supporting those families that find themselves in those terrible circumstances. So I think it's absolutely right that this motion talks about the CFO and the consular response that's required. And I think it is right to highlight the work by the APPG in Westminster, because quite simply, the support that's required isn't happening. Months can pass uh, before details are received by families. There's no single point of contact. There's translation problems and far too little financial support. And I think the issue raised this evening about the no notification and the fact that Police Scotland have only received seven notifications under the protocol that's meant to be in place, clearly that's not good enough. And I would be interested to hear from the Minister as to what he will be doing in terms of seeking reassurances that that situation will be improved. But I've also spoken with my colleague Hugh Gaffney, who's been working with the family of Craig Mallon, who died tragically in uh, May of 2012, and who is also featured in the documentary. The conversations that he has had with them, and also subsequently with me, has highlighted the difference between the situation in England and Wales and Scotland when it comes to post-mortems, and a, that's a point that I think Bob Doris uh, made. In England and Wales, the, the coroner will normally investigate the death of the person uh, who died uh, a violent or unnatural death overseas, and the body is returned uh, to, to, to the home country. The coroner uh, has a decision to take about whether or not to undertake a post-mortem, taking into account the manner of the death, whether a post-mortem was done in the other country, concerns about the process or any other extenuating circumstances. Now in Scotland we don't have a coroner and the rules are completely different and while they have changed, um, the, 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 that basic fact of the presumption that there, of a possibility of a post-mortem it's just simply not there. And I think one that I think we seriously have to question, I would be very interested uh, if the, the Cabinet Secretary has any thoughts about the ability to bring forward that right of a post-mortem when there is a tragic death uh, uh, abroad. Um, so it's right that, that the law has changed, but I think we need to look at the rules uh, that we have in Scotland because there is a question obviously for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, but there's also questions about what we can do here. And I think that point about the coroner and post-mortem would be an important step forward for many families who tragically experience the death of a loved one uh, uh, abroad. And I'll finish my comments there. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Alison Johnson. Uh, presiding officer, when we uh, go into another country, we present our passport. And in the cover of the passport, it says, Her Britannic Majesty's Secretary of State requests and requires, in the name of Her Majesty, all those to whom it may concern to allow the bearer to pass freely without let or hindrance, and, this is the crucial point for this debate, to afford the bearer such assistance and protection as may be necessary. So when they accept someone into their country, they're in essence making a contract with us that they will honour at that request from uh, Her Majesty. Um, but of course, the debate is about whether the support that we get from our own institutions in working with foreign jurisdictions uh, meets the requirements uh, that we have. Are they getting the assistance they need? And before I move into the uh, substance of my debate, I just want to personally uh, give a little vote of thanks uh, to Chloe Henderson, uh, who is a pupil at Fraserburgh Academy, who's been with me this week uh, on placement, who has done the research and written the notes uh, for my speaking tonight, and she's done uh, very well. Like others, my constituency ha has experienced uh, difficulties with people abroad, people dying, but I do want to speak about one uh, with a slightly happier outcome, but nonetheless illustrates the need for appropriate support. Let me acknowledge that uh, people need access to information and support at times of bereavement abroad, and they encounter endless obstacles and unanswered questions, uh, both from the Foreign Commonwealth Office and the Foreign Jurisdiction. 
There are many logistical challenges that are made harder by potential language barriers, including contacting local authorities, funeral directors, caseworkers. I want to just talk uh, for a minute or two about my constituent, Mr. Alan Wright, that my MP colleague, Ailey Whiteford, supported, who's from Port Soy. Uh, it was his uh, family in the northeast of Scotland who needed consular assistance after he was taken hostage while working in, the, in an Algerian oil field in 2013. Uh, what he thought was a power cut uh, turned out to be a terrorist attack by militants on the, in Amenas oil field. Mr. Wright and a colleague were forced to hide in a room with only a satellite phone to connect them to the outside world. In a television interview at the time, Mr. Wright, aged 37, half my age, recounted nine terrifying hours he and colleagues spent trying to remain hidden. Others uh, who were subject to that were not as fortunate and were killed. Uh, Mr. Wright had to make an emotional call to his family at home, not knowing if it would be his last. He chose not to speak to his two daughters as he didn't want them to remember the last phone call over a crackly line. He said, you fear the worst, you can't put words into how bad it you feel. So that's the environment into which we expect the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the Scottish Government, and local jurisdictions to respond to the needs of those in Mr. Wright's circumstance and his colleagues who were killed. It was a happy ending for my constituent, but it illustrates uh, the general point. Relatives who are looking for help often simply don't know what the questions they should be asking are, far less what the answers uh, that they, they need. So let me just conclude, uh, Presiding Officer, by saying it isn't simply a matter for a couple of people in my constituency or uh, scattered around uh, members' constituencies represented tonight. Um, a 2015 survey sent to 150 families found they didn't feel supported by the experience of trying to bring a loved one home after death. And more than half said the FCO were not at all helpful. In times of grief, there are many unpredictable factors. The people who are grieving are vulnerable and need a very special kind of help and support that has to be tailored to their individual needs. And I hope that this debate will play its role in alerting Scottish administration, but also the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and the jurisdictions abroad uh, to providing an enhanced and more relevant uh, form of support to those who lose people abroad. Presiding officer. Alison Johnson, followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I too would like to thank Angela Constance for securing this debate. Each of us in this chamber has experienced the loss of a loved one. We know how painful, sad and empty life can feel when, when someone so loved and so close to us is no longer here. And that is all the worse when the death is of a young person with so much life ahead of them. And in the case of Kirsty Maxwell, the loss was still worse. Kirsty's death occurred in unexplained circumstances, thousands of miles away from her home and family, in a country with a different language and legal system. It is in those challenging and terrible circumstances which nobody can ever be expected to be prepared for that we would expect the best possible support. In the case of Kirsty, and as we've heard, too many others who have died abroad in unexplained circumstances, that support has simply not been there. Kirsty's parents have said that they got no help whatsoever, no guidance about what to do from the UK or Spanish governments, and they felt, and I am quoting, utterly abandoned, very much abandoned. Kirsty's husband, Adam, describes the, port, the support received as the bare minimum, and Kirsty's family is not the first to experience serious problems in getting the support they need. And this has been a long running problem over many, many years. In 2014, the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee's investigation on consular services found significant and widespread failings in the support given to families of British citizens who have died abroad. From calls and emails not being returned, desk officers not being adequately trained to assist traumatised families, failure to appoint a suitable person to help, such as a liaison officer, and failure or even refusal 
to provide long-term assistance in the case of lengthy investigations or trials. You know, situations which can be terribly stressful, not to mention expensive, for some people possibly unaffordable. The committee heard from many families who had lost loved ones who'd received a poor level of support at such a difficult time. Well, that was 2014, so what has changed? To judge from the experience of Kirsty's family, not nearly enough. Kirsty's MP, Hannah Bardell, has worked tirelessly on this issue. She's established the all-party group on deaths abroad, and she has spoken of the difficulties in getting assistance where there is no conviction. Presiding officer, there is little sense of the Foreign Office being there to back you up in one of the worst possible situations a family can ever find themselves in and to fight their corner when things aren't happening as they should. Of course, other countries have their own legal systems and their processes and they must be respected. But helping bereaved families who've lost a loved one to navigate a legal system that is unknown to them, particularly in the case of an unexplained death such as Kirsty's, isn't interfering. Holding a country to their own standards, their own standards, isn't interfering. As Hannah Bardell has said, in Kirsty's case, there is a Spanish Victims' Bill of Rights which isn't being respected. It is not interfering to ensure that British citizens in a foreign country get access to the same standard of support and service as that country's own citizens. In closing, I'd like to pay tribute to Kirsty's husband, Adam, her parents, Denise and Brian Curry, all her family and friends who have been tireless in finding out what happened. In the BBC documentary referred to in the motion, Kirsty's parents say that they have promised their daughter that they will not give up until they get answers. And I know from meeting them that they most certainly will not give up. Their determination in such difficult and challenging circumstances is truly inspiring. The least we can do is to ensure that they have the full support of the UK government and the Scottish government, all the resources at our disposal to help find those answers. That support has been lacking in Kirsty's case, in the case of Craig Mallon, and in too many others. There's obviously cross-party agreement here this evening for the need for improvement and change. This must change and change quickly before more families are let down at such a difficult time. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Fulton McGregor, followed by Maurice Corey. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to Angela Constance for bringing this very important issue to the Chamber and for highlighting it and the tragic case of Kirsty Maxwell. In my contribution, President Officer, I'd like to concentrate on a young man from Cope Bridge in my constituency whose story, through being told in the, the local Cope Bridge and Airdrie advertiser, as well as national press, has touched many hearts. His story was also part of the recent BBC documentary referred to by Angela Constance and others. And I would like to put on record my thanks to David Swindle from the Multilingual Review team for the briefing. 26-year-old Craig Marlin's life ended tragically within hours of him arriving in the holiday resort of Lorette de Mar Spain on the 19th of May 2012 when he was fatally assaulted by a single punch in a busy street near several nightclubs and news quickly reverberated around the Monklands community. And, uh, and on the basis of cross-party working, I would like to make mention of the work of my parliamentary colleague Hugh Gaffney, who I know has done work in this issue with Hannah Burdell through the, the cross-party group at Westminster. <coughs> and I think that it's right that for issues like this, party politics are put well to one side. The case is unresolved, still open and subject to ongoing court investigations, but only as a result of the persistence of Craig's family, friends and previous employer who have sought answers. No family or relative should ever have to endure what happened to Craig Mallon's family. They learned about his death by a phone call from Craig's brother, not via official channels. When attending the Spanish mortuary for identification purposes, his body had not been prepared or cleaned, and there was therefore a lack of dignity. There was no second autopsy when Craig's body was returned to Scotland. Family liaison officers in Scotland could not, could not act, act, give active part in providing support, advice or updates. The family received a visit from Victim Support Scotland, who could offer no formalised support, financial or pastoral assistance. Some documented updates in Catalan and Spanish were sent to Craig's family from the British consulate, without being translated into English for them. Inaccurate media reporting and updates from Spain were confusing and did not confirm to Craig's family it was being treated as a homicide 
and that took until 2012 to get confirmation. The family were left to their own devices to recruit a lawyer in another country with no advice from the British consulate or other UK body. After a year, the services of this lawyer were terminated when it was learned that despite changing, uh, charging substantial sums of money, she had not provided progressive professional services. So, presiding officer Craig's family have had to navigate through a different legal and investigatory system in another country, only getting progress as a result of constantly pushing the Spanish authorities for answers. This was a family who, despite having financial and multilingual review team support, have still been struggle, struggling with the complexi complexities of this unfamiliar legal system in another country, country because there is no formalised support, structure or advice provided in Scotland or the UK as a whole. I am informed, informed by David Swindle that while there were British consulate communication shortcomings in the early stages of the investigation, the support pro provided by the Barcelona consular official in the last two years has been supportive as regards liaison with the Spanish lawyer and Spanish court to the extent that there is a meeting with the judge scheduled for the 30th of November this year regarding evidential opportunities. Presiding officer, sadly in April this year, Craig's mum, Antoinette, died aged 48, not seeing various key lines of inquiry being progressed and justice for her son. His father, Ian Mallon, is unable to attend tonight's debate due to illness, but he's hopeful that changes will be made to ensure that other families, unfortunate to lose a loved one to homicide abroad, do not have to endure what happened to him and his beloved Antoinette. I know the Cabinet Secret Secretary is sympathetic to this situation and the others, and I would ask if you would consider meeting the family of Craig and thinking about what options are available for supporting any others, although we all hope there will never be another that may end up in this situation. And I will end there, President Officer. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is from Maurice Cordy. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. May I also thank Angela Constance for bringing this important motion to the Chamber tonight. When a loved one is tragically killed abroad, families have to navigate their way through a nightmare of decisions, all of which tend to be unfamiliar and unclear. Ensuring that they have strong support in what must be a very harrowing time is sometimes that we need to get right, and it certainly needs to be done. Losing a loved one in any situation is extremely difficult, but when this happens in another country, with different procedures and processes to reckon with, families often feel they are left to struggle with limited help. Understandably, this lack of information, even at its most basic, can fuel feelings of anxiety and stress. A lack of communication is a standout issue. Too often, families encounter slow responses that fail to give them the answers they need. Often, families have been notified of the death of a loved one abroad indirectly and through the media and through wrong and unclear channels of communication. Families should never have to encounter this lack of clarity. Foreign protocols and procedures can be unfamiliar. Indeed, the way investigations of these deaths are conducted uh, fostered unwarranted uh, confusion. <clears throat> Even the wait for the return of a victim's belongings to their family can take far too long in many in instances. Surely it is critical to make these international processes smoother for the sake of Scotland's grieving families. Unhelpful speculation by foreign investigator is another issue. Offering speculation on the cause of death of a victim is not clearly good enough. It is paramount that families of these loved ones be treated with both respect and dignity. And for this to happen, they must be given answers and sincere answers with crucial details they deserve. And never was this demonstrated to me more than when one of my constituents went missing in the mountains of Vietnam and many months later was sadly found dead. Now support for these families can be furthered in clear ways. Surely if the Foreign and Commonwealth Office offered translation services, families members, family members could have a greater understanding of even the most fundamental answers, as such as the cause of death of a loved one. Repatriation serv uh, services are also worryingly costly and complex for families to handle. Funding should be far more readily available to lessen the unnecessary difficulties such as these. And the all-party parliamentary group on deaths abroad and consular services should be of great encouragement to families as we go forward in this unimaginable situation. This group hopes to improve the services and processes for bereaved families of loved ones who are missing in jail, have been killed or died in suspicious circumstances. It has served to show the gaps in our consular services and pushes forward recommendations for how these issues can be put right. 
And from my own military experience and working overseas, I can appreciate fully the need for this support to grieving families to be as helpful and efficient as possible. The armed forces community have lost many loved ones overseas on deployed operations. For the most part, these cases have been treated with the utmost respect by the forces, both for the bereaved and those who have passed away. But ensuring that their dependents are offered device, advice and support for an from an understanding single point of contact will help to remove the obstacles they, like other bereaved families in Scotland, can face. And to conclude, Deputy mm -hmm. Prime Officer, I welcome this motion and debate tonight, and I hope that for the sake of families enduring a tragic loss, support services will act with the greatest sensitivity and openness. Thank you. I now call on Hamza Yousaf to respond to the debate uh, for around seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, can I also uh, join in calls uh, from my colleagues to thank Angela Constance for bringing this important debate to the Chamber and also thanks to those who, who have signed the motion. I know all of us in this chamber would rather not be at this debate, we'd rather not be uh, dealing uh, with the issues that unfortunately uh, face families uh, in, in, in the case of, of the Maxwell family that they've had to suffer. But we are in this situation, we are here, and it's only right that we shine a spotlight and ask the questions that very much need to be asked, some of those uh, for, for, for the FCO, but equally some of those for uh, government in Scotland, but also for institutions in Scotland and support services in Scotland. So I am. Uh, I'm thankful for Angela Constance for bringing this uh, debate uh, to the Chamber. I also agree and associate myself with remarks that others have made uh, around perhaps a longer session. Uh, that is, of course, for the Parliament and the Bureau to decide, but uh, the Government, of course, uh, would be willing, uh, of course, to be part, uh, very much part of that debate, and I think it's, a, uh, it's just certainly an idea uh, worth further consideration. Can I also add, on behalf of, of, of the Government and personally on behalf of, of, of the First Minister, um, our sympathies once again to the Maxwell family who I know are here. Um, I think a number of people have mentioned this, that if any of us were in the situation the Maxwell family unfortunately find themselves in, uh, we would be demanding the answers to the questions that they are rightly demanding answers to. Um, whether that person is killed here uh, or abroad, every single one of us would want to know the circumstances surrounding that day the who, the why, the where. And as other members have said, the absolute complexity, uh, the, 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 the difficulties of navigating a foreign landscape uh, in these circumstances is something that I can't even imagine the difficulty. So I pay tribute to the Maxwell family and indeed other families that have gone through something similar for their tenacity uh, and, 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 and what they are doing on behalf of Kirsty's legacy to keep going uh, in that respect. So if I can just put that uh, on note. I can also put on note and on, on, on record uh, my thanks to, to, to the press and, 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 and to the BBC documentary for the Killed Abroad documentary and programme that was done. It is important that, uh, that, 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 that again, a light is shown on, on these issues, um, which ask questions that need uh, answers to. Um, uh, so, and, and I want to thank them uh, on record uh, for that. Uh, I'm very aware, of course, that Custis family uh, have not been satisfied with their experience of dealing uh, with the Spanish authorities, and I recognise the very strong view of, of the family that mistakes have been made from the earliest point uh, in this process. I will be meeting with Custis family uh, who are in the chamber uh, this evening alongside Angela Constance, I think their MP, Hannah Bardell, uh, also after this debate finishes to further discuss this truly uh, dreadful, dreadful uh, incident. If we can touch upon a few common themes that have been made by, by a number of speakers, uh, presiding officer. Um, before I do that, I, I just want to emphasise some of the action that we've taken from our, our Scottish Government perspective. Uh, the Chamber may be, may, may be aware the First Minister herself met with Kirsty's family in August, uh, and she heard their concerns firsthand, uh, and since then has taken forward uh, a number of actions. The Scottish Government has pressed the FCO to fully support the family in its efforts to secure justice through the Spanish legal systems. Uh, at, the, at the family's request, the First Minister also wrote to the Spanish Prime Minister seeking reassurance that the necessary resources have been deployed to allow the Spanish police and prosecutors to carry out a full and thorough investigation into Kirsty's death. Notwithstanding that, every single member, I think, has mentioned that the family feel that there have been deficiencies, not just in the Spanish uh, process, but also in the support that they've received 
um, uh, be it through the FCO or indeed uh, through other support agencies. And we will continue to liaise with the FCO on various aspects of the investigation, including the family's engagement with the Spanish legal system. But uh, somewhat related to Stuart Stevenson's point of view, that as members, as citizens of, of, of this country, when something happens, something as tragic and awful happens to us, uh, as has happened to the Maxwell family, we expect our government, um, Scottish, UK, whatever government uh, it is, to, to step in uh, and to provide the support services that we so desperately need. And on this occasion, there are some serious questions about whether the Maxwell family will receive that uh, or indeed uh, not, in which case, of course, uh, the family's view I recognise very much so. Um, we are very committed to ensuring that everything possible is done to establish the full circumstances which led to Kirsty's death. Uh, while there's been, well, there's no locus to investigate, Police Scotland have also been clear that they do stand ready to assist the Spanish authorities with their inquiries. Uh, to date, they have not been called upon, but that offer, and I want to reiterate this, that, that offer very much remains on the table. Uh, Police Scotland's family liaison officer, uh, they, they have met with Kirsty's family on a number of occasions about the case and continue to support them uh, through this difficult period. But when I meet with the Maxwell family, of course, we'll look to probe that further to see if there is more support that they need uh, from, from, from Police Scotland. In terms of, of, of the Scottish Government, uh, I've touched upon the First Minister and her interest and in, in, in the fact that she has uh, personally uh, intervened uh, where, where appropriate. Um, we, are more, we are also committed, and I am committed, to doing everything I possibly can to help the families, uh, the family, uh, the Maxwell family, but other families also who suffer the death of a loved one uh, abroad. And many uh, of my colleagues uh, from across the chamber spoke uh, about, uh, unfortunately, families uh, that they have in their constituency who have had a loved one uh, pass away abroad. And I've taken notes uh, on that, but equally, um, I, I will follow up uh, with them and with the families uh, as well, of course. Daniel Johnson. Thank you. On, on, I thank him for, for giving way. On the specific point about second post-mortems, will the Cabinet Secretary commit to looking at fatal accident inquiries, which does permit second post-mortems, but it has a very high threshold and a much higher threshold than that that exists in England and Wales? Hamza, you said. Sure. I, although I am conscious of time, I, I was coming to that issue uh, along with a couple of others, but I will address it just now. Uh, post-mortems, of course, uh, Daniel Johnson will be aware, are, are ultimately uh, the responsibility of the Lord Advocate. Uh, and, and I will raise this issue with the Lord Advocate. There was issues raised around the post-mortems and the possibility of a post-mortem, uh, rightly for the Lord Advocate, and understandably so for the independence of, 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 of the judiciary and independence of the Crown. Uh, but I will raise that issue with him. Uh, I will also uh, raise the issue that Bob Doris uh, mentioned around the change of, of, of law and fatal accident inquiries and, and for those that uh, uh, die, die abroad and killed abroad at the discretion of the Lord Advocate and asking about that threshold that you mentioned. Uh, and whether or not that needs to be re-examined and re-looked at again. But yes. I have to be fairly quick now. Thank you. Bob Doris. I really appreciate the, the comments you're making, Cabinet Secretary, but there, there's always been the wider issue about how the Lord Advocate can make an informed decision. To use that discretion, one of the ways the Lord Advocate could make an informed decision was when families have got concerns, he could instruct a post-mortem which could inform that potential discretionary decision. Right now, he's flying blind a little bit in the information that he has available. Hamza, you sir. Yes, I, I think point uh, well made and, and, and on the record. As I say, I, I personally will, will, will raise the issue with Lord Advocate. Of course, I'd invite other uh, members of the Parliament uh, to, to, to do so. I'll just end, because I'm conscious, uh, Presiding Officer, uh, of time on the Victims Task Force, which I've mentioned um, and, and, and I announced. And uh, Angela Constance previously asked me about whether or not we will look at um, the experiences of those uh, victims, uh, families of, of, of victims uh, who have died uh, abroad. I, I absolutely will do that. Um, but what I'd like to do is also extend that out to other families um, uh, as well. Many families have been mentioned uh, here. I think I got a specific request from Fulton uh, around the family of Craig Mallon. Of course, I, I would be happy to meet with them, uh, perhaps uh, as part of a wider format. I don't know if he thinks one-to-one -one is better than, than, than either way. But for the Victims Task Force, we should absolutely look um, at the support that is needed uh, for um, families of victims. Uh, that have died uh, abroad. I will also engage with the old parliamentary group uh, that Hannah Bardell uh, has set up and has a, played a key role uh, in, 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 in founding and supporting. Very happy to engage with the group on its call uh, and to review into the support provided for bereaved families uh, and Scottish Government officials I know are due to meet the old party group 
uh, in the coming weeks, and, and, and I'll look forward to read out from that. But I will write to Hannah Bardell, uh, as the chair of the group, to offer my assistance in this important piece uh, of, of, of work. Um, I will also look into the issue uh, of Police Scotland notifications, which was also raised, and uh, again, I'm happy to keep members, specifically Daniel Johnson raised, but other members that have spoken in this debate, uh, updated on the progress of that. So uh, I look forward to now meeting with the Maxwell family, uh, Deputy President Officer. I really do thank Angela for giving this important issue an, air an airing uh, in, in this parliament, but I agree with those around the, the, the chamber that perhaps uh, there is a wider and a further and a more in-depth discussion to go, but I thank her uh, for bringing it and I thank members uh, for some very, very helpful contributions uh, for the government to take forward. Thank you. That concludes the debate and the meeting is closed.